Dina Del Russo. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So tell us about the cannabis, cannabis the card game. Cannabis the card game is a fill in the blank Q and A game, and we do have action cards. It's similar to apples to apples or cards against humanity, but the difference is that we do have action cards in our game. So people are actively smoking while they're playing the game. And um, it's really funny, a little bit twisted, a little bit educational. We have a glossary in there, so if people don't understand a term or a person that's related to the cannabis industry, they can just look it up. Okay, and thank you this evening for bringing this beautiful display. Oh, the colors um, are really uh, exciting, bright green. Um, so before we go deep into the rules and how to play, Give us a bit of background. So tell us about yourself, any kind of formal training you've had, any involvement in the weed sector, and how did you get to create this game, you and your partner? Okay. Um, in the 90s, I was actually actively involved in the hemp industry, and I was working with musicians as well at the time, and they wear backstage passes around their neck. So I made lanyards out of hemp, and they said, don't hide it, light it. Oh, and great. so the bands that I worked with, they wore them, and it was really fun. And then I, I can't remember which one of the bushes it was, but one of the bushes came into power, and he decided that there's not going to be any hemp made here. We had to import it from Romania. It became extremely expensive. I was in my 20s, and at that point, I just couldn't afford to do that. So that was kind of the end of that, and that was, that was my introduction into this industry. Um, and it really frustrates me, the whole sort of anti-hemp, yeah. uh, because I know if I smoke this paper, which is equivalent to like, you know, there's no THC no, in it. No, there's um, none. Yeah. I mean, it, hemp, hemp is kind of the future. It could, the, the crops grow very easily. The soil can be reused. You can make paper, medicine, clothes, rope, everything out of hemp. But, you know, there, there are reasons. And you did indicate earlier, in the, um, prior to starting the show, that you had some, uh, you did some training at Oaksterdam. Yes, I went to Oaksterdam University in Oakland, California, which was really interesting. I learned everything from how to grow to the local laws and all the medicinal uses for cannabis, and it's it's really just unbelievable. Could you discuss any kind of um, formal training, like in a university, that may have helped you with the framework to get the game going? Um, well, I went to the University of Miami. Do you mean from Oaksterdam? Uh, no, um, a different kind of, like University of Miami. Yeah, I went to the University of Miami. Um, I have a degree in sociology. I had a double major in communications and sociology. I was a social worker for Children of the Night, which is um, child prostitutes. Mm. Um, there was some drug use going on with those younger children, but um, it, it, di it didn't really sway me in one direction or the other. I'm not sure that that actually is what brought me to this point right now, um, but uh, somehow I ended up here. Okay, <laughs> so why don't you tell us, um, again, because I think a little backstory is helpful. So take us to the moment where you realize that uh, this game and, and pursuing it, creating it with your partner was for you, like the thing for you to pursue. Okay. Was there one defining moment? Well, yeah, um, I, I met my partner through LinkedIn. We had some mutual friends in the cannabis industry. Uh, she introduced me to Cards Against Humanity. I had never played it before. I'd never even heard of it. We were playing and all of a sudden we just thought, why isn't there a game like this for cannabis? This is a really funny and fun game. We should do this. So uh, we just decided to go for it. And I am not a drinker, so I don't do much alcohol drinking, but I think it's fun to play games, you know, get high and play games. So we created a company called Weed Games, which is basically going to be a brand of cannabis themed party games. And okay. this is gonna be our first game. So. Um, how do people learn about the game? Is there a way, like do you have a website you want to share with we us? We have CannabisTheCardGame.com. We are on Twitter and Instagram, at WeedGames2015. We have a Facebook page, Cannabis the Card Game. We're on Mass Roots at WeedGames2015. Or that might just be Weed Games. that one. We have so many of them, but we're on all the social medias. Excellent. Cannabis the Card Game or Weed Games 2015 Yeah, I think nowadays you almost have to have an aggressive social media yeah, strategy like no that choice. to just 
disseminate it. So why don't you tell us about these uh, goods that you have here and just kind of walk us through what's on the table and okay. then let's talk about the rules. Okay, so this is the box that it comes in. Uh, we have the question cards, which would be the green cards, and then the answer cards, which would be the white cards. So basically, let's pick a question. This is a question. You have somebody who starts out by reading a question, and then everybody chooses 13 answer cards, which are the white cards, before we start playing. So the first person starts by reading the question, and this question is, if everyone smoked weed, the world would be blank. So you go through your 13 answer cards, and you think, oh, this is a really funny one. You put it down in front of the person who read the card, who's the dealer, just kind of happens mm -hmm. to work out that way. And then they pick up all the cards one by one, and they read the question with the answers. So if everyone smoked weed, the world would be a magic carpet ride. That's potentially one of the answers. There are no right or wrong answers. Mm -hmm. It's just whatever you think is funny. So when the dealer reads, each question with each answer, whichever one they find to be the funniest, wins that round. Ultimately, there is a winner at the end of the game. I'm not sure that everybody takes it that far because mm -hmm. of all the smoking and everything. They may not get to the actual end of a game, but they can. Okay. So the rules, <laughs> there is seem, an end in sight. the rules seem pretty straightforward. Yes, it's um, very basic. And so, so. some of the questions, um, uh, what was the process of you and your partner coming up with the questions? We just literally sat down and just started talking about things. Um, I remember a couple of nights I had smoked some weed and I just sat on my computer and I was just pounding things out you know you just funny things that had happened to you while you were high um, for instance once I was smoking when I was younger and the roach was stuck to my <laughs> lip and I didn't know so that's something that's in there because that may have happened to other people and, yeah. and then when they read the card they're like oh yeah I remember when that happened to me so just funny things that happened when you were high or things that you've seen or heard that were funny and they're maybe more funny when you're high right. so and then there's some things in there that aren't funny that have to do with the government and stuff mm. so you can read uh, the glossary like I said and um, figure out what you don't understand in okay. the game. Okay, so yeah, it seems pretty fun. Would you say an average game, maybe three or four people would go on for how many hours? Well, you know, sometimes there's a short attention span there mm. <laughs> with the weed smokers. They get distracted with other things, but definitely at least an hour. Okay. It would definitely go on. I mean, it could go on forever if you really wanted it to, but uh, I, I would say the minimum would be about an hour. That That's probably a good time. Got it. So let me look at one of these. And so this is one of the cards that people would pick up and read, right? Yes. Okay. All the green cards would be the question cards. Okay. So the green card is the question card. Yeah. And this one says... Listening to your favorite band while high makes you feel like... Blank. Okay, I, I got you it. You know, so it could be uh, smoking a joint with your drug counselor. Or it could be staying high because you like the view. You know, whatever you think is funniest, that's what you put down. You put them down face first and push them in front of the person who's the dealer. And again, it's funnier if the dealer reads the actual question with each answer. Mm. That just, you know, you get a better it, effect that way. Exactly. Yeah, no, I like exactly. that. Exactly. Excellent. So um, just to digress a minute, are the cards and the box, the packing material, hemp? Are they hemp produced? No, we actually looked into that extremely expensive mm -hmm. because we don't have a lot of hemp production going on here in the States right now. Um, it was our goal to get the game made in the U.S., and that was nearly impossible. Mm. The prices are astronomical here, so unfortunately we did have to um, go outside of our country to get this made, which kind of stinks for us because it takes months when you do it that way mm. for it to happen. So we just got the games uh, about a month or a month and a half ago and they started production in November. Wow. Yeah, so it took about three to four months between them actually setting up everything, us approving everything, and then getting it over here. Okay, and I remember visiting your website and I saw an image of a pallet uh, filled yes. with games. They finally arrived. We were so excited that they had finally arrived that uh, 
we asked the printer to take a picture <laughs> and uh, we posted it on our website. Okay. Yeah. So another question, again, these are questions because I want to make sure if people do get a chance to visit the website mm -hmm. and they uh, get a, uh, um, a, a, a copy of the game in their hand or a version of it, um, do you recommend a certain strain that might go well when people play the game? I'm a sativa smoker. I don't like to be tired and hungry. I'm not a couch potato pot smoker. So I actually love Durban Poison, which is a pure sativa. And nowadays, unfortunately, everybody creates hybrids. Mm -hmm. Most weed strains are maybe a sativa dominant, maybe an indica dominant, but they're mixed together. It's very rare that you have just a sativa or just an indica now. So Durban Poison is a pure sativa and it, it is my favorite. Okay. Yeah, it's very creative, happy, slightly euphoric, makes you feel really good. Yeah, no, yeah. these things are important because I think when you talk about pairing, you want two things. <laughs> like that, a fine wine. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, and I think it could enhance the, the experience. Exactly. So what about um, any kind of public events that you've been to? Maybe give us an example where we may have seen you in, in the card game, and then t tell us about a like a typical conversation that may have you have had with a visitor to your table. Okay, we did 420 Fest recently here in Denver, which wasn't that great because it snowed mm. heavily on that yes. weekend. So that kind of stunk, but there were some troopers who, you know, they, they came out and uh, you know that those are the people who are really into it if they're coming out during a snowstorm like that. But once people saw the game, it clicked in their mind that this was similar to other games that they had seen, apples to apples and cards against humanity. So people were interested. They would come to the table. We would play rounds with them. It was really, really fun. And uh, during the 420 Fest, they have something called the Rollin' Joint, which is a bus that comes mm -hmm. so people can go on there and consume cannabis so they don't do it outside on the grounds. And so when people were going out and smoking and then coming back and playing the game, that made it all that much more fun because inside of the venue, we couldn't smoke while we were playing right. the game. No, so thank it you. kind of enhanced it a little bit. And then do you have any upcoming events or appearances where the game will be featured? We actually just had an event the other night um, at The Drink here in Denver on 15th Street. I'm not sure what we have coming up. We haven't signed it up for anything in the summer, but we're probably going to be doing some festivals. We might be doing Denver Flea for the summer market. Okay. So well, those are things we're looking at. Great. Oh, and one other thing. So um, the game comes with our branded rolling papers. Okay. <laughs> and so when you Which is really cool. When you purchase the game, the rolling papers come The rolling inside. papers are Okay. Inside. Yeah. That's great. And it's the card game rolling papers. And so we just have a few seconds left. Let me just ask you, um, what do you anticipate by this time next year in May of 2017, where you may be going with your company and with the game itself? Okay. Um, we are uh, having conversations right now with a retail outlet who is really interested in carrying the game. We're trying to work out all the logistics of that. So we're hoping by this time next year, we're going to be out there in this store all over the country. And I'm not sure they're worldwide, but they're definitely nationwide, which would be a great outlet for us. Uh, we had some dispensaries who have picked it up. So we're kind of going to broaden our horizons. All of them have been in the Denver area. We're going to kind of start branching out on that and uh, doing some more events. So by this time next year, everyone should know Cannabis the Excellent. Card Game. Well, Dina Del Russo, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having uh, me. One more time, give people the website uh, where they can find more about yeah. Uh, the Cannabis the Card Game. CannabisTheCardGame.com. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back with um, uh, uh, Daniel, a trimmer. And um, during the break, I have a video I want to share with you from a student of mine in the anthropology department at CU Denver. The student created the video as part of a class that I teach called Cannabis Cultures. And the video is a digital story, a first person story about cannabis cultures. So I hope you enjoy the video. <laughs> I grew up hanging out mostly with boys in Brooklyn. At that time, our sidewalks were not littered with strollers and tricycles, but instead were littered with needles and used condoms. I was a rough and tough tomboy, learning how to use a screwdriver before learning how to braid my own hair. People knew me as the bossy one and not afraid of getting a black eye, which I did get the day before my fourth birthday. My childhood love for fart jokes developed into my adolescent talent for burping, winning me plenty of esteem among my guy friends. One of my major accomplishments as a teenager 
was chugging jungle juice. During my youth, instead of beating up boys, I wrestled them, fearlessly taking them on, fully confident in my strength to take them down, and earning myself title of undefeated champion. 3-0. Rolling fatties, smoking blunts, ripping bongs, drinking beer, swigging vodka, throwing parties, and eventually getting caught pretty much summed up an ordinary summer. I was the pusher man, the alcohol procurer, the money collector, and the party organizer, introducing marijuana to my friends and maintaining the steady supply of dubs and eights via my connects, the Lezzies, Fat Pat, Pat Pat, Stony Tony, Leon, and Dice. Smoking weed was serious business for me. I was the one who was already rolling another blunt while the first one was still going around. You know Michelle from Dazed and Confused? That was me, one of the guys. Not one of those giggly girls who couldn't keep it together, laughing nonsensically, like Kitty Foreman, Jackie Burkhart, or Donna Pinciotti from that 70s show. I could kill a whole large pie to myself. Using weed wasn't to get closer to the guys that I liked. It wasn't to be cool for anyone or to impress anyone. I smoked it because I loved everything about marijuana. My day and life revolved around it. I rolled blunts with pride and smoked them with purpose, inhaling as much as my swimmer's lungs could hold. My fingertips were discolored and calloused from holding roaches and most of my clothes had cherry holes in them. Since my marijuana smoking days in high school, Colorado and a few other states legalized cannabis. The imagery associated with marketing marijuana often shows exploitation of the female body. It does this like imagery of barbecue sauce dripping down a woman's bikini-clad chest for hamburger commercials. Marijuana isn't just for guys, and guys are no longer dominating the cannabis market. Women are cannapreneurs, can advocates, and cannabis users. What's the point of a half-naked woman hitting a phallic bong lying on a beach? A more realistic image is a woman hanging out on her couch, drinking with her girlfriends, and getting high. With me tonight in part two of the show, I have Daniel. He's a trimmer in Colorado, so we're just gonna have a conversation about life as a trimmer. Daniel, welcome to the show. Hi. So let's just jump right into it. What kind of cannabis-related work do you do? And explain it as if your grandma's listening to understand the actual tasks or, or whatever responsibility you have as a trimmer or in your related work. Uh, well, good question. I actually had to explain this to the senators yesterday that didn't know what a trimmer was. Um, essentially, I'm the guy that takes the product from the growing point to the shelf. Like, okay, it's all done. Now I'm the guy that's going to chop it down, make it pretty for you. I mean, the entire day, I mean, as an example, our client tomorrow, we're going in and we pull all the plants down and we remove all the large, you know, leaves. We hang everything to dry. We come back in, you know, three to five days or whatever the time point is for it to dry. And then we're actually going to go back and trim it and pluck it off the stem. Okay, so back to what you said at the very beginning. Last night, you got to speak to some senators, and senators, like some people in the general public, don't know what a trimmer is. They had absolutely no idea. And what were you doing there last night? What it was asked and what did you say? I was basically there to give an uh, employee perspective on what risks or chemicals or things we might be exposed to, how, how are we affected on a daily basis, what do we feel like when we go home, and what what we potentially might face in the future. And okay. So this is like a follow-up conversation to the event you were at last night, yes. so it should be straightforward. So as a trimmer, is there one or two safety concerns that you have? The biggest one right now beyond any of the pesticides would be the powdery mildew that most of the companies are not doing a damn thing about. I mean, they pretend to, they try to, nothing ever changes it's consistent and it's so easy to just make an effort and nobody does because it costs money to make an effort and nobody's gonna spend money. 
Okay, that's pretty significant. So powdery mildew, what is it? And then what's the remedy? So if I'm a, a grower, um, are, are there a couple things that you know that might be a good remedy? I am definitely not a grower. So as far as like anything that I could tell you to specifically take care of it, I don't want to give input on that because I don't want to be the guy to tell you wrong, to be honest. I, I don't want to claim that I know more than I do. I mean, I guess, I kind of lost my track okay. there. Um, um, so the question was about uh, PM, what is powdery mildew? I mean, it's, um, I mean, to notice it, like as far as what I smell or what I see, it is a, looks like, you know, somebody went inside the middle of your grow room, took a firecracker, an M80 and put it inside a bag of flour and lit it. And then that shits all over your plants. If you breathe that in, it's very harmful. You will have lung problems, you will have headaches the skin irritations alone you get little red bumps all over your body like you literally you have to go home and shower and wash every single thing that you are wearing wow and a lot of people that have a home grow have to get naked at their front door to not infect their entire house with everything they were exposed to okay so i'm so glad you're here and i'm so glad you're talking about it because most of the discourse that i hear in colorado is um, protecting the consumer to make sure that they have clean weed, they have pot that's not polluted with powdery mildew. But what you're bringing is a perspective among workers where there is a safety issue that deals with powdery mildew. So how do you protect yourself? Like what strategies for, do you do to, to maintain your health? For the employee, the most that we can do, we're not necessarily provided a protective outfit. You're, you know, we're all, I mean, the current company I work for, we're privately contracted. So we work at multiple locations. So if we want any sort of protective gear, like as far as a, a suit, you could say, we would definitely need to provide that for ourselves. We are provided with face masks, gloves, and you know, the standard you know, toiletries that you would expect to see. We have functioning you know, bathrooms wherever we go, you know, the basics, obviously. But anything additional has to be provided by you. Okay, so for um, consumers, for them to understand powdery mildew, take us through either your own experience or a coworker's, like w expand on the effect. Like, why can't you just sort of suck it up? Like, like, what's the actual effect physically? Breathe it in and you'll find out real quick. It, like, just before, not even combustion, just the inhaling of it on the plant that you're working with, it, I mean, instantly breathing issues, like hard times breathing, like asthma type, you know, type effects, you know, itchy and burning throat. I mean, you know, the, the, the fever, like, you know, horrible migraine sweat and, you know, the rash, it's pretty instant if you have any sort of sensitive skin. I myself, you know, I'm HIV positive, so I have a compromised immune system. So I just have to deal with it because I want to pay my rent. Right. I can't say anything. And then we have to make that moral judgment of like, do I step up and say, hey, you guys really need to throw this away? or do I let them serve it to the customers that they're planning to sell it to? Right, well, yeah. after, after listening to you, it makes me think trimmers need hardship pay to deal with this uh, health hazard of powdery mildew. I mean, we are definitely a very under, undervalued service. Uh, most places, you're lucky to get 10 bucks an hour. I used to get 20 a couple years ago before mm. it went recreational and everybody moved here and was willing to take 10 and the employees all know and the you know the bosses will tell you if you're not willing to do what we're offering I got five guys right there that are willing to do it and they're gonna do it for ten so right and, and that um, for me is a bit hard to hear because you find in Colorado there is a celebration of weed business celebration of weed culture but there's this um, hypocrisy in the sense that um, some business owners not all of them some business owners you know they want to portray a positive image but when it comes down to you know dignity in the workplace a fair wage health benefits um, and all these other things that are part of a decent workplace, uh, we find them missing. Is that something that, that is based on your experience kind of yes, accurate? Yes. So one of the things I'm interested in is, um, <clears throat> I do understand in Colorado, in a bunch of other states, California, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, Minnesota, Maine, and New York, and Maryland, that the UFCW, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, is active with the group Cannabis Workers Rising. So why don't you just give me your um, impression of the union? Do you agree that it's a vehicle, uh, meaning a contract, a labor contract? Is that a vehicle that maybe could address some of these issues that you're talking about? Absolutely, because every time a boss tries to tell the employees that handle 100% of their business from bookkeeping 
to purchasing, to selling, to bud tending, to growing, to trimming, when you tell us what you can and can't do, you forget that all you're doing is pretty much writing the checks. We're running your business, so don't tell us what you're capable of and what you're not because we're the ones running your business. Mm. So this is interesting because I know um, in workplaces that sometimes a worker maybe who is fearful of anti-union retaliation from their employer, what would you say to someone who's a coworker that they're like, uh, I'm a little bit fearful because I don't want to get you know, uh, any negative repercussion, including firing. How, well, how would you respond to someone like that? Everybody's got a choice as to whether or not they want to work for a union, you know, I mean, it's, if you're not comfortable with it, then nobody's going to force you. Okay, that's this good This is to an know. option. I mean, if you have a great HR department that does everything for you without fail, with no problems, good, good, good. You know, everything's working for you, great. If it's not, you've got options. Yeah, and I think this is something viewers may be interested because in Colorado, again, we want transparency, we want fairness, we want the sector to succeed for all people along the supply chain. So maybe in closing, um, what would you say um, uh, by this time next year, uh, are you hopeful about conditions of trimmers such as yourself that they may be improved? And if so, or if not, what gives you that hope or lack of hope? I mean, to be honest, the, the bill that I was testifying on last night I didn't know a whole lot about it until about 24 hours beforehand. I did a little bit of reading on it and I would love it if it passes because there are some great things that is going to prevent the, the big bosses from doing what they want. Somebody else is going to be going in and collecting the samples that are getting tested. Excellent. Daniel, I'm sorry to cut you off. We're out of time. I'd love to have you back. You raised some important issues. Thank you for tuning in tonight. This is Marty Otanias with Getting High on Anthropology.